this forum for giving me opportunity to uh, begin the presentation. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yes, sir, you yes, can. Sir. We, uh, first of all, I would, uh, I'm happy that uh, I'm giving a talk to Sai with a group of institutions. I didn't uh, initially know that it is uh, starting with the name Sai actually. Being, uh, having studied an alumni of a Sai group of institutions, I'm very happy that uh, we give the opportunity to talk. Also, thanks to Mr. Shiv Prasad also, who also happens to an uh, alumni of another Sai institutions, so, uh, such Sai institutions. Uh, I'll just uh, this is my uh, PhD topic. I'm going to present. It is uh, a detection of heart sound, heart disease by heart sound analysis using AI, with particular reference to pediatric cases. I'll just give a brief background also because uh, there are many others uh, like, uh, for example, uh, from physics and chemistry also I'm seeing who are there in, in joining the session uh, and other subjects like commerce also. So I'll just give you a very brief introduction to AI. Then afterwards, I will give about AI in healthcare, how it is uh, applicable, how it is useful. Then afterwards, a little bit about I, Internet of Medical Things, which is uh, next to uh, after IoT, that is a trend in the future. Then I will come to uh, my topic. Before actually doing the presenting what I am uh, did, I had to give a lot of background information so that all can follow me. Uh, computer, pure computer students, I am sure, will be able to un, un, follow me easily. But for others, uh, uh, I had to give a background introduction because which is difficult. In for computer science, so... none of my classmates are there. Only I am there. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, uh, maybe I must be uh, knowing him possibly. What does that change? Someone, I don't know. I'm going to talk about AI. Yeah, it seems. Yeah, at last I am doing the meeting. Okay. Hello. Sorry, I can't hear you clearly. Okay. Can I continue? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so first I will just give you a, a brief introduction about AI. First is, uh, uh, what is AI? Basically, I'll just go through it very quickly, not take too much time on these things. A artificial intelligence uh, enables computers and machines to mimic the perception learning, problem solving, and decision making capabilities of the human mind. Uh, that is very important. Basically, it is to, uh, what is AI means is say it is that which will mimic human intelligence, the human, human mind. That's why it's called artificial intelligence. There are two types of AI broadly, a narrow AI, which equals human intelligence in very small task, very narrow task. Like for example, uh, yeah, image recognition, or translation, language translation, etc. We uh, have, uh, but that a particular each uh, algorithm will do only one particular task, and will not be general. What we also have is artificial general intelligence. We are not at easy stage. Maybe other eight to ten years, we may reach a state. A man can may reach a state where the computer may have uh, be able to do have general intelligence also, not only a, a particular very narrow specific problem to be solved. Now, there are different types of AI. One is uh, the knowledge representation and reasoning, uh, which is where the set of rules are there and based on the reasoning given in that, it will try to detect and then give a good output. Then we have uh, automatic planning. That's just one type of AI. Then we have machine learning, one type of AI. Then we have natural language processing, then computer vision, then uh, uh, the robotics. Robotics, of course, is a mix of many other different subjects also, like um, mechanical and electronics, etc. Then we have a artificial general intelligence. Uh, now we come to machine learning. It is, uh, I'm going to focus more on machine learning. It's a subset of AI. It comes under one category of AI. Uh, Arthur Samuel defined machine learning as the subject of a computer science field, 
that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. That's very important thing here. Learn without being explicitly programmed. So it learns from experience. Generally, human beings learn from experience. So uh, AI, uh, emission ML is a program which learns from experience and becomes better with experience. ML analyzes data and learns after making assumptions and provides prediction. It can be used for prediction once you give the data to it, from which it will analyze and give prediction. Now we have a formal definition by Tom Mitchell about machine learning. A computer program is said to learn uh, from experience E with respect to some class of task and performance measure P. If its performance at task in T as measured by P improves its experience. In the, that's what uh, so it has to learn a set of tasks and then improve in those tasks after some certain experience E. That's the basic idea. Now we have to understand the difference between the, the classical uh, the traditional programming methods and machine learning system. Traditionally, what you do is uh, one second, I just show the pointer. Traditionally, what you have is a programming system that is you write a program for that, then also key input data to the program. Uh, the program is uh, written by a person with all the rules, etc. And then data is given to it when it's running, and it will give output based on the data given and the program code given. But in machine learning system, what happens is that you don't give the code as such, you give the input data and also the output. Then the machine learning system will learn from the input and output, try to find a pattern in that, uh, make a function approximation, and then give a model out of it, which will be used for uh, some so purpose like prediction, uh, analysis, etc., or classification, prediction, etc. That's the difference between traditional programming system and machine learning system. So the idea is that in traditional programming, you give all the rules and rules, then, uh, so, uh, then it will try to give the output based on your rules and rules. Whereas in machine learning system, you don't know the rules. You just give input data and output data, what's supposed to be. It will make uh, some, uh, some uh, optimization function based on your input and output and we make a model out of it. And then we can use that model for future forecasting, prediction, or for a classification. It is a, a way in which, uh, and also it's supposed to learn with experience and become better after experience. Now, there are a lot of things involved in uh, machine learning. First is the, the data to be given has to be pre-processed. You cannot give raw data most of the time. You have to pre-process it so that it is suitable for the uh, for you being used as input for the model uh, model builder, uh, the algorithm. That is, uh, you have to do deduplication. You have to normalize the data. Error corrections have to be done properly. Then you have to next is to train the uh, 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 next is data labeling is there. When you are giving input, for example. Uh, in the case of uh, my uh, my project, which I'm doing for my PhD, I give uh, 1,000 hard audio recordings, each or in only, uh, each two to five seconds. So I have uh, two categories. One is the normal auto recording and abnormal auto recording. Abnormal means there is some disease with it. It's not, the sound is not normal, the heartbeats. So when I give the data as input, I have labeled it each that this is normal and this is abnormal. Let's say, uh, Ideally, you should give it to a roughly equal to have balanced input. But sometimes medical data, you don't get balanced to you get balanced easily. But when giving input, I give labels. By the input yes. data, it will try to analyze and predict or future tomorrow. I give one sound, hard sound as the input. It will give uh, output whether that sound, uh, hard sound is uh, ha uh, person having any disease or is not having any disease. So for that, the thing is that. Uh, uh, machine learning involves also some domain knowledge. Some amount of domain knowledge required. So for example, suppose I am doing a, a building a model, machine learning model for uh, for a bank, which will try to predict whether uh, give a, a answer to me whether I should give a loan to a person or not. Uh, when a person applies for loan, for that there are some uh, you may collect data from the person, lot of data, maybe some fifty to eighty data points. And then you have to choose feature from, the, from those data, which will be helpful for prediction, and then uh, uh, give us an input for the algorithm. So 
the person decides what is used for the machine learning algorithm to be given as input. You cannot give everything. You have to choose what to give, which will be making sense for the algorithm for use, for its use. So a feature is nothing but an attribute or property shared by all the independent units of which on which analysis or prediction is to be done. Suppose you uh, give uh, anything as input, let's say, uh, uh, even for, uh, uh, I said, I want to give the uh, prediction for the market, the stock market. So I had give input for last one year or so, or five years or 10 years, suppose so I get enough data. So what all data points I, which I, I had that I had to give for as input for the algorithm, that I had to do it and then maybe uh, choose what is useful, what is not useful. Sometimes combine some features to make it suitable for input. Sometimes remove some features. All the things come under feature engineering. So that's an intensive process. In machine learning, actually, 80% it, it, of the time goes on feature engineering and data post processing. A lot of time goes up. The model building takes only 40% time. Uh, uh, Next is the steps. I just briefly tell you about the steps involved in the production of a machine learning model. Model means why you tell model is because when you build a, after you build a model, you give an input to it, it will uh, give output uh, as a prediction or a classification or forecasting, something like that. So first is you have to define the definition of the model and the need of the model you have to give. Afterwards, you have to collect suitable data and give label for the data, which is a very tedious process. Then afterwards, you have to pre-processing data. Suppose, uh, for example, for my uh, my work, suppose I give a certain uh, the sounds may not be suitable. I have to remove the, because when recording, the person may have been recorded. Uh, may have been recorded in a clinic or some outside area, which is having a lot of noise also, environmental noise etc. So I had to do some pre-processing to filter the noise and cut off all sounds above a certain range and below a certain range. That is pre-processing. That differs based on the domain. Then there are more than one dozen algorithms also in machine learning or even more actually. So all algorithms are not suitable for any problem. We had to choose a particular problem or choose four or five and see which one works the, works the best. Afterwards, you do training of the model by giving it enough number of input data and output data, label data, so that the model can be trained. Then once the model is trained, you have to do the, the, the testing of the model. Without testing, you cannot use it. So first testing of the model, sometimes you have to go back after testing to the uh, 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 second phase or even first phase also. Uh, based on testing, you have to uh, relook at the previous steps and do it again. It's an iterative process. No one can get it right in one single step. So it is uh, involves many iterations. Afterwards, you integrate the model in system to make it usable for end user. That's the steps in the production of ML model. Now, there are different types of machine learning uh, algorithms. Uh, broadly, there are, there are many others also, but very, very broadly, I just uh, restricted myself to these three only. One is uh, supervised learning. That is, uh, uh, you give data with labels. For example, I have given data with labels. This is normal heart zone. This is abnormal heart zone. Then afterwards, I give a, a final of the, a normal, final abnormal. Give to it. It will learn. I give the label. This is normal, abnormal. Learn on its own and then give output uh, at the model. Whereas unsupervised learning, you know, suppose I give photos of, say, let's say cats, dogs, and some other animal. It will try to find out on its own and classify and do. do uh, uh, see, uh, clustering to separate the three, the cat, dog, and some other animal, and then accordingly learn, uh, uh, then give a uh, output when you give a new input according to that. So that is uh, by uh, clustering, the separate on its own, cat, dog, etc. Now, reinforcement learning is like when we play games or, or, or self driving cars, etc. Et first, initially, you introduce a set of rules and give a, a set of rewards and punishment. If the output is correct, means you give a reward for it. The output is not correct, you give a, a negative marking for it. So after many iterations, you may get, uh, that, that's for reinforcement, you may get some model which is suitable for use in the real world. Now, uh, one other major type of uh, machine learning model is EN, artificial neural network. Uh, it's one model which is uh, very, very useful. And uh, it has been a, a game changer in the world of uh, computer science. This ANN model, where Dr. Robert H. Nielsen told that is ANN is a computing system made up of a number of simple, highly interconnected processes, processing elements, which process information by the dynamic state response to external inputs. 
So uh, this is made up of series of layers, each layer having multiple nodes, or the nodes are called as artificial neurons. It's called called a uh, neural network, artificial neural neural network, because it is simulating the way how our brain works, whom brain works. Uh, that is, the brain is supposed to learn on its own. So this is also supposed to learn on its own. And there are many neurons in the brain. So here we have something called nodes. Each node having one, one uh, implemented by a function takes input and gives some output, just like our neuron box. Neuron gets a receptor, receptor and also gives some output also. Same is similar to design as a uh, somewhat based on the human brain. Uh, one interesting thing is that about the, the learning part is very important in machine learning and, and, uh, and other uh, types also. Because I uh, just want to tell you one small thing, interesting thing. Uh, uh, probably around 15 years back, the scientists, what they did is, they, they did an experiment on the frog. They cut the nerves from the, uh, that is one region of the brain, which is helpful for learn, for visual, for uh, the all uh, visual acts by the frog, seeing by the frog, visual by the frog. They cut off that particular uh, area, uh, link to that area on the optic nerves or the frog eyes and connected to some other portion of the frog's brain. To their surprise, they found that after a few weeks, the dog learned to see, see the frog learned to see with the, with the new connection also. That means the brain is capable of learning new things also, new function also. I suppose a particular unit of the brain cannot see but if you connect uh, optic nose to it and train it for some time, it is the frog has learned how to see with a new region also. So it became blind initially. That's the uh, that's what artificial the, in brain is actually. So neural network is supposed to uh, be designed on a similar way. The neuron receives input from the neurons in the preceding layer and gives output to neurons of succeeding layer, uh, just like our brain works. The input to each neuron is set of feature values multiplied by the corresponding weights, which is then summed up to determine the weighted happiness. I'm sorry, I'm not included but in math formulas, just to make it a little bit easier. So the value is processed by the activation function. Every neuron has, the neuron has activation function. Uh, and the nonlinear function in the neuron, uh, like uh, for example, you have a, a, a sigmoid function for those who are interested in maths, like uh, y equal to one by one plus e power minus x, the sigmoid function, which will be like a, a curve like this uh, somewhat. So it will be uh, between zero and one, or sometimes minus one to one based on the function, how, how it is. So the value is processed by activation function, the nonlinear function in the neuron to determine the output. The activation functions are nonlinear, the various weights of the output are adjusted during training to get the accurate output. Now, once the output comes, again the output is fed back to the input layer based on errors. It matches with the actual value, what should come and what has come. The difference is again uh, sent back as error to the input layers for feeding backward uh, back propagation until it gets it by adjusting the weights until it gets it correctly. The first and last layers are the input layer and output layer. The middle layers are is the hidden layer since they are not seen by the um, uh, uh, by the interface to the network and the output layer also. Hidden layer no consists of activation functions. Now this is a uh, simple uh, artificial neural network. These are the input layers with multiple nodes. This is the hidden layer and this is the output layer. Output gives one. It's a, if you are using it for, for, for classification, it will be it will give an output cat or dog. It will give a, it's a, it's a use a sigmoid function, which will give a, 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 a sort mass function. It will sort which gives among multiple probabilities, it gives one or one output, one with maximum probability. Uh, a cat or dog or some other animal, it will give one actually. So that is the output. Now <laughs> Deep learning is a, a subset of machine learning that is built using artificial neural networks, where in the artificial neural network, you have only one layer in the hidden, in the, this part, only one layer, hidden layer is there. In deep, deep learning, we have multiple layers. That makes it uh, deep, that's all. So the, out, uh, so the word deep is due to the number of layers in the middle being more than one. And hence, uh, DL is called also called deep neural networks. So actually, it should be called deep neural networks, but to make it short, they are called as deep learning. The word learning is used because as the model processes more data, the accuracy or the prediction power increases. Therefore, it's said to be learning from its experience. So this is the machine learning, which all uh, we already know. Algorithm that you part of the data <coughs> learns on that and makes informed decision. 
deep learning structures algorithms uh, in which layers to create an artificial neural network that can learn and make intelligent decisions on its own deep learning is a subfield of machine learning while both fall under the broad category of ai deep learning is what powers the most human like ai this is a simple figure of uh, deep learning you have network inputs here there are multiple hidden layers here one two three in this case you have an output layer uh, and the network output is there this is a feed forward one layer gives uh, takes input from the previous layer preceding layer and gives output to the succeeding layer this is a feed forward network based on initially when training training the, uh, the uh, deep learning model when the output comes it is compared with match with the actual what it should be and then the errors are sent back to the model and the weights are adjusted so as to come close to the actual values what it should be that is called back propagation the back propagation is nothing but uh, actually a application of calculus sometimes i think a, a machine learning and deep learning are just an applied mathematics if you say if you know no calculus if you know no probability if you know linear algebra uh, statistics then you, actually you can learn the deep learning machine learning very easily it's not at all difficult i uh, just uh, this uh, slide is portraying the difference between those uh, three ai ml and dl ai is a system that mix human intelligence machine learning is a system having the ability to learn on its own from data deep learning is a type of machine learning that uses artificial neural network to learn uses a neural network to learn as it is so actually deep learning is a subset of ml and ml is a subset of ai now uh, this is one more uh, difference is that in deep learning and machine learning in the machine learning what you do is you give us you take the input and then you do feature extraction feature extraction you do that is whatever input is given from that extract what features to be given as, as input to the algorithm that you need manual intervention because uh, you need extra the features and person should have domain knowledge uh, most of the time to do this particular part then uh, then uh, uh, you do the uh, the classification or sometimes prediction also then output comes car and not car in deep learning model the most important thing is that the input is straight away given to the algorithm without any step in feature extraction this feature extraction step is indicated with classification or is not there at all we the human beings don't need to do it is given uh, then straight away the model uses the input and gives the output car or not car that's a major difference so feature extraction process is very tedious need domain expertise and takes lot of time as i told you um, machine learning algorithms 80% of time goes for the initial layers initial phases the steps like pre processing data uh, and cleaning the data and deduplication and removing the unnecessary things a uh, lot of time goes on then feature extraction lot of time goes on in this you spend only 20% time building the model deep learning you just straight away give us input the data and then it learns on its own from the data and gives out now in conventional uh, for not talking about medical images just to give an example uh, for medical images uh, for traditional machine learning you give medical images as input features are extracted manually from the images pre processing is done to the features to make it suitable for as to be given as input then you select from the suppose you have 100 features from each image or 1000 features from each image you select the most suitable features for the model then you give it to the um, input model for then the model building happens here then prediction happens after the, uh, you use the model for prediction in deep learning you give medical image input the learning is full one single phase one step only and prediction happens so you uh, bypass all uh, the one two three four these four steps this is a workflow of ai systems for prediction models so just to highlight the difference between deep learning and machine learning Uh, one uh, uh, major difference is that deep learning it learns on its own, but it needs a large amount of data. That's a big drawback actually. For some fields, we get data. For example, you want to to uh, for banking domain, finance domain, we have the banks have huge amount of data. Finance domain, they have a lot of data. For, for the stock market prediction, they have a lot of data. But uh, for some things like um, the medical domain, data is very difficult to get. Uh, maybe you have few hundred data and data in silos. Each hospital or medical organization may have data, which may not 
uh, we will need to share, it may not be possible to share also because of so many constraints. So data is very constraint in deep learning. Machine learning, it does well with small amount of data also, like few thousand data also or a few hundreds also, it does well. Hardware requirement for uh, machine learning, you can do with low end system also. A simple core, right? Uh, when I was doing, I did one machine learning technique with a very simple core i3 system only with uh, uh, 8 GB of RAM without any GPU. It worked very well and in a few uh, minutes I got output. For, uh, for deep learning and implemented, I had to uh, run uh, the, uh, the, the, the process for a long time. Maybe I should plan so that I start, in, uh, start the process and go for lunch and come back. Sometimes it still will not get over. Because deep learning uh, is uh, like a lot of time, is you know, most huge amount of processing. And also, if you have GPU, it does much better. Still, it is uh, 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 not enough, actually. Sometimes it takes a lot of time. Sometimes many days or a few days, actually. So deep learning, you need a very powerful system to do it, actually. Uh, so, uh, sometimes you can use online, like Google Colab also, or uh, even uh, uh, Amazon has a facility for doing online thing. And uh, you have a paid also a three version. Three version comes limited to certain um, compute units, what they call. After that, it will become very, very slow. So uh, you, then you may be forced to buy your computer units to run, uh, do your work to continue processing. Then uh, one thing is that uh, machine learning, you need to understand the features. For example, for, for uh, uh, banking uh, domain, for loan, you need to understand all the, each and every uh, data point about the user. Right from age and salary to everything, you have to understand. And then how what is it, it represents all the things that understand, give us input. The, in deep learning, you just have to understand the basic functionality of data. You need to understand each and every small thing. The training time is short for machine learning, as I told you. For deep learning, is very long, actually. Sometimes it takes a few seconds for any machine learning, or maybe a few hours if data is very huge or very complicated algorithm. But for deep learning, it may take a few hours or sometimes weeks also. So there are many deep learning or machine learning algorithms, as of now, actually. Many are there. And people are using combination of machine learning algorithms, like uh, they're called Ensemble Technique. Where they use three or four algorithms and choose uh, the uh, the majority of that decision for the final decision. They have bagging on type of al 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 algorithm which use combined uh, two three algorithms. Boosting is there. The many such ones actually. Deep learning there are a few actually nowadays. Deep learning also the number of algorithms have increased. Many new ones have come up in the last uh, two years or so. Uh, one important thing is machine learning algorithms. When you get the output. You can interpret the output very easily for most of the cases. I'm not saying for every case, but most of the cases you can interpret the output very easily. It's not difficult at all. Except for some cases where there are too many features to involve thousands of features, means it may be difficult to interpret. But deep learning algorithm, because it's a neural network of uh, in deep learning, multiple layers are there. Even the person who designed the network, after a certain, after four to five layers, he himself cannot understand what is happening. So suppose uh, you know, the, the algorithm model which are built gives a prediction, let's say it is a cat or a dog, he cannot get reason for that. He won't be able to understand the reason why it gave that. So you have to accept as it is such. So interoperability and explainability is a big factor in deep learning, which scientists are working on now to resolve it some way. Now, generally, this overview of that AI is the goal. Ultimately, AI is the goal which we want to reach. Actually, we are not reached. Maybe partly we are there, maybe 24% or so. Machine learning is a vehicle to get there, get to AI. One of the vehicles you can say, this is a car. And then the fuel for machine for the car is data. Data is a fuel for that vehicle. I just added these slides in case uh, there are some people who may not be familiar with AI, that's why I added. I hope it was okay for all of you, for most of you. And next, I come to AI in healthcare. This is a very... Uh, Important thing because uh, uh, there are uh, many domains where AI has been applied, like uh, so called banking, finance, even education also. AI, like Coursera or some other MOOC sites, use artificial intelligence to predict and to evaluate a person also. And there are so many things actually. We say we have uh, uh, last few months, six months or so, we have many other new tools as like chat GPT, language, large language models, etc. So AI has been applied so many different. Most of the domains, even for driving also, automation, automobiles, anything applied to, to make, uh, to produce self-driving cars, etc. So healthcare also last few years, they have tried many things to make it, uh, make it uh, faster, quicker, more accessible 
uh, uh, much cheaper than what it is now. Make it quicker, uh, faster also, and also uh, make it uh, uh, smaller or portable so that it can be taken to to remote areas. Also, for example, if you have a, the big instruments which are uh, then hospitals, some are the size of a fridge, some are even uh, bigger than the fridge, or maybe two three fridges combined together. Big instruments are there. Future, what one of my uh, my co researchers told in my from, from, from abroad, you may have a hospital in a suitcase. All the instruments in the hospital will fit in a suitcase. That's how it will be. And the doctor can go and take it to a patient and do whatever required to treat the patient. So there are many different ways in which AI can be used in healthcare. It can be used for uh, patient facing. You can have AI chatbots to talk to the patient. You have variables as a device. I'm sure all of you are aware of variables which uh, records the heart. Even Apple uh, phone also has some serious um, uh, app to, uh, to, uh, to monitor the heartbeat. Then you have per se genetics. Each person's genes are slightly different actually. So the per se genetics is there to study the genes and then give personalized medicine for the person based on the problem to be treated. For mental health also, we have a lot of apps these days. For women's health, for skin care is there. Telemedicine is there. It solves a lot of problems for remote areas. Lifestyle management is there. Because a lot of things are there. You, uh, diseases these days, you lifestyle management, like uh, BP and diabetes and uh, heart problems, etc. Uh, once the disease is there, what to do about it? Prognosis uh, and other things are there. can be done by, uh, by many different ways. Then doctor facing. Now, medical records, just like other records, medical records also can be, uh, AI can integrate to make it uh, more efficient, more accessible and easier to use. Then you can do data data analytics with the medical records to, to, uh, to get prediction or diagnosis or prognosis. And medical imaging is a very major area in which AI is being applied. I will come to that later. Then hospitals have so many other different AI tools which can be used. Genetic research also uses AI. In research, we have for discovery new drugs, they use AI. For emission and clinical trials, AI can be used. And it's not that we are talking about it. There are a lot of tools available now also. And the future is going to be going to much more. But AI has been being used for many of these things. Genetic research also AI being used. But traditionally, when you see the model, compare the traditional model of healthcare and the AI integrated model. Traditionally, we have uh, the first one here, uh, physical presence of patient required. Then after the patient gets a problem, there is a treatment, that is uh, reactive treatment. Next is we go to large number of procedures and interactions to uh, do a diagnosis and then whatever required to treat the patients. In the AI integrated model, we have a, a different way. Physical presence is not required most of the time. Not essential for most of the cases. Then you have preventive recommendations. You can take preventive uh, preventive care instead of always being reactive. Uh, be proactive. Then lesser physical interactions and cost also natural reduces. So advantage is twenty four to seven availability. You don't have to wait for twenty four to seven availability. Improved prediction accuracy is much better. In fact, the AI tools which for the imaging radiology which use is much faster. Radiology uh, if you give an input. Uh, image to a, a built model, it gives in 15 seconds the output. A doctor may take 15 minutes to check on uh, X-ray to give us, give us uh, diagnosis. The model will give in 15 seconds or even less. So costs are reduced, quicker diagnosis, and personalized treatment is possible with AI. It is not possible with traditional methods. So uh, generally, it can impact healthcare in different ways. One is improved diagnostics, advanced level treatment can be given more easily, patient engagement is boosted, then a lot of admin set support tasks are uh, made easier by AI. So there are applications of AI in healthcare which are hey, being... Are you on the YouTube early? Hello? Excuse me? Sorry, I didn't hear a question. Okay, then we have... Cardiovascular disease research which, in which uh, AI has been used. For example, we have a cardiac... Uh, 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 system in one hospital in America where they diagnose a paper, they take a 3D image of the heart and diagnose within 15 seconds what the problem is. A doctor may take 60 minutes. That system uh, find out within 15 seconds to maximum of 60 seconds. Medical image will come to the There are a lot of applications in medical imaging. That discovery manufacturing is a major application of uh, there are applications of AI. Health records can be maintained integrated with AI. Clinical support system integrated with AI. Surgical robotics, the robots can do surgery also. And you know, there are a few cases 
future that will more of those those cases you may see yeah precision medicine yeah population health management for um, managing health of the large section of population yeah uh, um, smart health devices which will take care of uh, patients then uh, for tracking pandemic we have also have ai tools for that then medical imaging have radiology where ai is implemented been uh, already integrated in many uh, many hospitals diabetic retinopathy is a disease which makes the person fully blind unless it is found out early and treated early a can help in finding out about the uh, uh, detecting this very early oncology also same case only there are many tools available, available which can detect the cancer early then biomarker is that genes marker is that suppose person gets cancer the genes the, the something there will be a change in the genes actually the biomarker will able to identify it much quicker and faster and with much lesser cost so cancer detection from gene expression data tumor segmentation can be done with ai tumor development can be tracked with ai and prognosis detection predicting the likelihood of expected development of disease can be done with ai there are many ways so the outbreak of prediction diagnosis of diseases medical image diagnosis drug discovery personalized medicine medical records and health on health records so there are practical use cases which are being uh, implemented have been implemented in some by hospitals in uh, western countries that uh, a therapy cell is that for cancer detection it reduces the unnecessary tests advanced tests usually a patient goes for advanced tests because doctor is having some doubt in this case it eliminates advanced tests and gives clearly whether cancer is or not cancer so for genetics is that to identify the mutation of genes causing cancer idx dr is that is an autonomous medical image diagnostic diagnostic system for for detecting diabetic retinopathy now arteries is that medical imaging platform to diagnose heart problems within 10 seconds compared to 16 minutes by a doctor can is the difference sepsis prediction and optimization therapy spot real time predictive analytics to detect sepsis earlier why i am telling all these things because there are a lot of i think we are giving a talk to the students of the engineering college here in computer science uh, ai etc so all this being done by computer science people only doctors are only giving the input and say what they want as users there is computer science people are writing algorithms for all these things and giving uh, apps or instruments we integrated with ai which will be doing all these things sir. so future the students may be able to is exposed to these things they may be doing some projects which are uh, ai related to healthcare that's also possible we have uh, all india is a collaboration with the hospital to get data it's not difficult actually we have inner eye by microsoft which identifies and displays a possible tumors from 3d patient scan but they have not the, the, the uh, thermal tics to detect breast cancer at early stage by a bangalore based startup uh, a niramai next we come to internet of medical things future of as i told you future it will be a hospital in a suitcase uh, generally we have iot which everybody knows about the first to a network of devices that connect communicate autonomously over the network they gather data using the sensors and route it through other, other parts of the network without human intervention basically without human intervention they can connect network and transmit data iot is a uh, similar only but is related to medical things IOMT is a collection of medical devices and applications that connect to healthcare information in technology systems through online computer networks. Medical devices equipped with Wi-Fi enable machine to machine communication. That is the basis of IOMT. So IOMT devices linked to, uh, to cloud platforms where captured data is stored and analyzed. IOMT is also known as healthcare Internet of Things. Examples of IOMT is the remote patient monitoring, tracking patient medication records. Whether it's taking medicines properly or not, taking location of patients admitted to hospitals, collecting data from patients variable by mobile health devices, either um, through mobile app or some other uh, instrument connected to the body of the patient, connecting ambulances en route to medical facilities to healthcare professionals. So using I O M, uh, then we also have uh, a telemedicine. It has been started many hospitals, including such hospitals have telemedicine feature. For example, a person from Orissa. or west bengal we have a telemedicine center in, in, in calcutta and in, in katak in orissa where the patient comes once a week on a particular day and then the doctor uh, in uh, the white field they attend to the patient remotely and check him and then uh, advise him and if required he will come to bangalore or to puttaparthi for further treatment otherwise the case is solved there only so using iomt devices to remotely monitor patients in their homes 
spares patients from having to travel to hospital or physician's office. How does it affect healthcare? It increases the amount of health data available to caregivers. You get the caregivers get more data. The variety of sources you get much more different type of data transmitted and analyzed. More transmitted data improves both patients and providers decision making capability. If you have more data, it improves decision making ability. Provides the devices and networks that enable telemedicine and virtual care. Remote healthcare capabilities become popular during the COVID-19 became popular during COVID pandemic. Makes healthcare more accessible. So benefits are empty, patient monitoring, accessibility, cost also certainly reduces, and accuracy also is better. Now, there are many things you have uh, uh, infrastructure of IOMT, a diabetic device connected, uh, variables like uh, something like a bracelet, then uh, patient is connected to this uh, the cloud. You have a health app, which also goes to physician uh, for his input. Then we have other instruments, ambulance is also connected to the cloud and to the other devices. Uh, electronic medical records connected from the cloud to the patient and doctors also. Care taker is the, the paramedic staff also connected to the uh, to the cloud. Then the we have smart bed also, which uh, if you have, if you have a lot more chatter generated, which is given to the doctors also collected at the cloud. Patient monitoring system is done in the hospital itself through these things and monitoring all reports is done uh, by IOMT. The benefits are obvious actually, high quality of patient lives, accuracy of treatment, cost is certainly reduced, higher patient engagement with employees, workflow is streamlined, high employee efficiency, is employee. doctors can see more patients much quicker, much faster, labor demand is reduced, workload is reduced for doctors, and as protection against cyber crimes is also in there. Then the challenges are there actually for this to be implemented at the mass level. It will take some more time for it to be implemented. One is limited data, uh, because as I told you, A needs a lot of data. The black box issue, as I told you, the doctor can, cannot explain why the decision was made. Whereas the patient expects, patient expects expect to be uh, uh, told everything in detail. And then the doctor, the data is there, but how to ensure security and privacy data is a major question. There are a lot of regulatory issues also. In Europe, it's very, very strict actually about sharing data. Patient consent is required to take any data. Then uh, one more thing is that traditional algorithms, once you write the algorithm and, and it is pushed to the users, no more changes there. Maybe once in a month or once in a year, update will come. Whereas this machine deep learning algorithms are, are adaptive algorithm. That's it. It's not a static algorithm. It keeps changing after it learns. That is one thing which is um, uh, some uh, agencies don't accept, like FTA. I have to approve the algorithm that is an adaptive algorithm, not static algorithm. Then it may it will be uh, used by mass level, used at mass level. Accountability, for example, in healthcare, suppose the system doesn't work properly for some reason, and then uh, something happens to the patient. Who is accountable? The 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 engineer who wrote the program, or the company, or the doctor, or what that's accountable. So, for example, for same for car also, self driving car. Suppose accident happens for a self driving car. Is the engineer responsible for the accident? Are the company responsible? Are the person driving who, who owns the car? A lot of regulatory issues which are yet to be resolved. It will take uh, some time for people to come to uh, uh, for discuss solutions and uh, give the rules and releases for these things. So now I come to the heart natural problem, cardiovascular diseases. Why this problem is important? Because uh, as uh, most of you may, may not be aware actually, one out of 100 babies born are, are born with a defective heart. That is one percent children born with defective cardio. That is congenital CSD, congenital heart disease. And when, uh, from birth itself, the heart disease is there. 17.9 million people died from heart cardiovascular diseases in 2019. 32,000 of all global deaths uh, as per WHO uh, records. And one more thing is that uh, is a very few in number. For whatever reason, because uh, suppose a doctor finishes NDBS, he wants to choose his uh, 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 specialization. They may choose one which is um, uh, based on different reasons. Uh, because, uh, for example, uh, radiology or uh, uh, for skin, what they, what they say, skin care, etc., uh, all those things, so that more in, in demand, the radiology is in demand by all doctors, all, all uh, sorry, uh, all domains. Not only one, not only cardiac, one not main domain still meant no radiology. All doctors, all hospitals need radiology, radiologists. So more in demand uh, that is that. Uh, then one more thing is cardiology is a problem is that uh, 
it, it was huge investment to set up a cardiology treatment center very much and then it requires a lot of training and expertise to uh, to do heart operation particularly for children and next is that uh, uh, it is is uh, unlike other things radiology the doctor sees the x-ray and gives the diagnosis in 15 minutes and goes off here doctor has to stand beside the patient for 3 hours 4 hours sometimes 6 hours also i have known of i have known of heard of cases where doctor in puttapati standing next to patient monitoring continuously for 6 hours because the heart is such a uh, uh, such a such a cancer device such a uh, what is organ which can fail any time without warning other is, other other uh, body part may not fail like that without warning heart is can be uh, fail without warning so doctor has be monitoring the patient continuously suppose doing operation or post operation for many hours so this is uh, not so uh, uh, means uh, doctors don't choose this uh, situation so much actually as per the, as per the WHO standards, India needs 88,000 cardiologists. Can you do you know we have 4,000 cardiologists in India? Compared to the requirement of 88,000, we have one cardiac center for 1.2 lakh people in Western countries. Uh, in other countries, we have 15 to 20 million for 15 to 20 million population. We have one cardiac uh, uh, doctor. In USA, we are uh, as per the 2019 standard uh, data. Uh, 3,000 pediatric cardiologists are there. In India, we have 300 as per 2019. So 300 cardiologists. That is even less. So in USA ratio is, sorry, in USA ratio is 1 is to 29,000. One pediatric cardiologist. In India, it is 1 is to 45 lakhs. Can you see the difference? So pediatric uh, cardiac surgeon is even more dismal, even less availability. So uh, uh, one thing is, uh, I won't go into details of this. Actually, just give you basic things. Uh, for you to understand uh, the heart, because I am doing working in heart sounds, for that you to understand how heart sounds are generated. So this is the heart, uh, picture of heart divided into basically upper part and uh, lower part, two parts are there. In the upper part, there are two chambers, the right atrium, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the right atrium and the left atrium. Lower part, the right ventricle, left ventricle. Right atrium receives blood from the veins and pumps it to the right ventricle. From here to here, through this wall. Uh, then right ventricle, which is blood on the right atrium, bumps it to the uh, lungs, to the, uh, the pulmonary wall. Here, this is pulmonary wall. Lungs, it uh, oxygenates the blood. Again, it comes back, the left atrium here will receive the blood from the lungs and pumps it to the mitral wall. This is the mitral wall here between the left atrium and the left ventricle. It goes to the left ventricle. Left ventricle gets the blood rich with oxygen. And pumps it to the uh, the aortic wall to the rest of the body. To this, that's the basic function. Of the, now, the wall is a very uh, critical component of the heart, the heart structure. The wall is basically a one-way door. Opens on one way, one way, and closes back actually. So that is the function of the wall to allow the blood to flow in money one direction. It's not blood should not flow in reverse direction. That's very critical. Now, if you see the tricuspid wall is a pulmonary wall, mitral wall, aortic wall, tricuspid here, pulmonary wall is other. So the wall present the, to prevent the backward flow of the blood, supposed to at least. The valves are actually flaps, leaflets, that act as one-way inlet for blood coming into the ventricle and one-way outlet for blood leaving ventricle. All valves are three flaps, except for mitral wall, it only has two flaps. I'll go and skip this thing, right side and left side, actually. Basically, I already told you overly what it is. So, the wall is the most critical moment, I told you. Of course, there may be sometimes holes in the heart also which causes the blood to flow from one part to other part where you should not go. Generally, wall is a more common problem. The wall should be form properly formed and flexible. Wall should be flexible for opening and closing. So, we should open all the way fully so that blood can pass through smoothly. The wall should, when it closes, wall should close tightly so that no blood leaks backward into the chamber. So, heart walls can have several problems including uh, regurgitation. Regurgitation means due to leaky wall, the blood flows in reverse direction. After wall closes also, the blood flows backward. The wall doesn't prevent backward flow. So that is called regurgitation. Then uh, uh, stenosis. The wall gets narrowed. This is a, uh, a lifestyle disease. A person after 40 or 50 years may get this problem. The wall gets narrowed because of uh, the uh, accumulation of sediments in the wall. And atresia, this is a for for congenital heart disease. The wall opening doesn't develop normally during childhood. So this is the basic thing about the walls. There are four heart sounds in generally. The two main sounds are the lub and dub. You must have heard the sound, you must have 
Try to listen to sound or put your hand and see on the heart. Love and dub. Love dub. The first sound, love is S1. At a short interval, it is S2, the dub sound. The sound, the gap, the phase between this S1 and S2 is called systole phase. And the, the duration between S2 and the next S1 is called the diastole phase. Uh, systole is when the, the vertical contract the pump blood. Diastole is when the ventricles relax and fill the, uh, the, 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 the chamber with, with blood. So these are the, that constitute the heartbeat. Sometimes you have third and fourth sound also, uh, S3 and S4. They are called S3, they are much lower pitch sound, S3 and S4. S3 and S4 are not common and they may be indication of disease. S3 is that it can be innocent sound also, it is a murmur. And S4 is there means it surely cause, uh, that means the person is having heart disease. S4 sound means uh, is guaranteed that the person is having heart disease. Whereas S3 can be there for, in, for innocent cases also. Now, heart murmurs. murmurs uh, suppose you see a, a water pipe. The, the water is flowing smoothly through the pipe. But there is a bend or kink in the pipe. The flow is not smooth. That time you hear a, a whooshing sound. That same thing for the heart to heart also. When there is uh, the passage is narrow or some the blockage is there, then the sound will come because of backward flow or because of narrow opening in the wall, because of which extra sound, the swishing or whooshing sound, that is called the heart murmurs. The apart from love and down heart sound, the heart murmurs are there. That is the sound due to turbulence in blood flow in the heart. Just like water pipe, if you hear some sound, that is due to turbulence. If water is flowing smooth, you want to hear any sound. If there is turbulence only, you hear some sound. Same thing for the heart. The murmurs due to congenital disease, that is like hole in the heart or wall. Effect. In others, the murmurs due to heart wall, Others due to calcification of the heart or other problems. The, the murmurs can happen due to uh, 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 regurgitation or stenosis. That is uh, the narrow of uh, innocent murmurs are also that which are not caused by heart problems can disappear after childhood. It can be uh, sometimes exercise and fever, anemia also can cause innocent murmur and due to thin chest also. This is the, basically the, uh, the, the phonogram of the heart sound. Yes, this is the audio uh, phonogram signal, the recording of the heart sound displayed in the waveform. This is S1, this is S2. S1 is S2. This extra sound here, if you see here, that is called systolic murmur. S1. So if the sound comes here, you see that's diastolic murmur. What is not innocent? Diastolic murmur is not innocent at all. If the murmur comes here, that is not innocent. There is some problem here. That means there is some problem. Person is having some disease. If the murmur is too loud, then there is also a problem. If it is covering full systolic phase, then it can be a, and be a problem. And then uh, uh, the, the lump and dub sometimes don't occur as one single sound. There will be some gap in that. That also can be a sign of problem. I'll just show you. The, you won't be able to hear on your normal speakers. You have to wear a headphone to hear the sound here. I'll just demonstrate the sound here for your... Not able to see Okay. okay, now you can hear with headphone only you can hear the sound. Normal sound. I go to innocent murmur. You can make out the extra sound. Now, this is a murmur which is having a surely a disease, a sign of a disease, battery murmur. I hope all of you can hear the sound. I am sure you can hear it head headset. Now, now with normal speakers. That's what I found. Okay. Now the tools and techniques for, for uh, uh, detecting the uh, heart murmurs are as follows: electrocardiography, uh, call EKG, then electrocardiogram, call ECG, then computer tomography, then uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, then auscultation. You see that the first four methods are involving very, very 
some are very expensive instruments, some are okay, moderately, moderately expensive instruments. Last is auscultation. Auscultation, I'll come to that later. So most of the tools involve uh, investment and recurring expenditure. Expensive resources, including doctors, are used efficiently. Also, we use doctors for these things. Doctors are the most expensive uh, uh, resource in a healthcare system. Auscultation is where you listen to the sounds of the body during the physical examination. All of you must have seen that, uh, experienced it. Uh, doctor putting a stethoscope on the back uh, or chest. So auscultation is usually done using a, using a stethoscope. Doctors usually routinely listen to person's heart, lungs, and intestines to evaluate the sounds. The, how they, the frequency of the sounds, intensity, what duration, the number, the quality, etc. is valued by the doctor. But the problem with auscultation is that it is difficult to interpret. And years of experience required, clinical experience. For example, when I talked to a doctor in our Raipur hospital, see, Satsai Sanjivani hospital, the doctor told him, uh, he is a reasonably expert uh, compared to the, all the students who are under working under him. Those who are, they rely only on equipment and technology, they, don't, they are not able to diagnose it by auscultation. But he is not as good as his teachers and his seniors who are very good in auscultation. Uh, that is one thing. Next is incorrect diagnosis. After years of experience, also a doctor could make a diagnosis uh, incorrect, which is incorrect. And there are a lot of false positives also. Doctor may say patient is having some disease, and he'll say, just to be sure, he'll say go for the test. Or you hang out also, he'll say go for the test. Most of the time, the resource, expensive medical resources are wasted in unnecessary tests. We have a phonocardiogram from norm. When you have a recording, a phonocardiogram is a plot of high intense fidelity recording of the all sounds and murmurs made by the heart with the help of a machine called phonocardiograph. Phonocardiography is the recording of the of all sound made by the heart during cardiac cycle. One lapped up fully, the next step is called lapped, is called a cardiac cycle. Now, solution for these problems, as I told you about doctors, health, the uh, health system, doctors, and this cardiac part in particular, solution is to increase reliability of these uh, devices by developing better algorithms for analysis. And as I told doctors, some more expensive resource, can be handle the paramedic stuff also, these uh, devices. For example, uh, uh, injection was given once upon a time, 20 years back, uh, or once or years back, or so I don't remember exactly. Doctor only could give injection. Now, uh, paramedics of a nurse can give injection. So, like that, uh, future you may have many things which are done the paramedic staff uh, who are trained for that. Then you don't need a uh, doctor to do those things because doctors are most expensive in the healthcare system. Advantage of this such a device is that increase confidence, reduce costs, increase the availability of advanced diagnostics. Because advanced diagnostic systems are used unnecessarily. If you don't use unnecessarily, it will be available easily for those who genuinely need it. It frees up doctor's time for more uh, productive use. Heart sound recordings. Sir. It's an inexpensive area to acquire heart rate variability to compare to other heart sound recordings. You see, it. it's a non invasive procedure. You don't need to uh, do anything much to, uh, complicated to get recordings sir, compared to other methods. It can be done by paramedic staff, and even in remote areas, it can be done by without doctor's intervention. The goal is to recording all the heart sound for the most 20 seconds, whether patient should be referred to advanced diagnosis or not. That's the goal actually. Now we, uh, PCG with murmurs and without murmurs. This is the without murmurs, the first one here. Sorry. There's a point. This is the first one without murmur. This is with murmur. You can see murmur here and murmur here. These are the uh, PCGs for various diseases. This is a normal one here. This is uh, for a disease called aortic stenosis. This is for mitral regurgitation. This is, uh, you can see the, uh, the wave patterns here. Now, objective use analysis. Our objective use to analyze heart sound of children uh, because uh, generally uh, I took up the, the pediatric cases because uh, we have a pediatric hospital, such as engineering hospital for pediatric cases, pediatric uh, cardiac uh, 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 division is there. So, uh, I, I because of that, I got a lot of data because it's our own hospital. Uh, otherwise, getting data is very difficult in this field, as I told you earlier. So, to identify whether the child is having heart disease or not, then not only that, suppose it is it is abnormal uh, abnormal sound, the patient is having some disease, you have to further classify into uh, five to seven major categories of heart disease. That's more, that is still more difficult. So develop algorithms for neonatal cases also to detect cardiac uh, uh, congenital heart disease. Then use of digital 
how to do it? There are many methods, methods are the traditional methods where do a single posting to filter the hot zone recording and do the post processing. Other machine technique is to extract the appropriate feature vectors for PCG input. Third, the deep learning method is to analyze the hot zone to classify them as normal directly the input and then normal abnormal. So what uh, traditional was done is using DSP only by the use uh, Fourier transform, uh, discrete variable transform, etc. And get some parameters and divide these signals into uh, first reduce segmentation or segmentation, divide the signals so that they can identify which is S1, which is S2, which is next S1, next S2, etc. And then do further processing. So same thing used for other things also like speaker identification, speech frequency, etc. Is that at a macro level analysis signal using many mad tools also? We have customized processes also for things. For the ML and DL, you have generic, generic algorithms uh, for saying doing the same thing. At the macro level, is done. You don't need to go minute details actually. So ML model signal uses learning brain. Uses powerful CPUs, GPUs. For hot zone, what is the procedure? The steps. Hot zone signals are applied. Then they are pre-processed to remove the noise. Uh, let's say for this, for my case, it is above 900 hertz. Remove, cut out those sounds above 100 frequency and below to 20 hertz also because hot sound will be within that only. Then extract features. Uh, done both ways. Directly inputting the uh, uh, sounds. Uh, so uh, uh, extracting features also. Then we choose a model for classification. Then build a model and then give, get result in the form of what percentage, percentage accuracy. This is the basic uh, steps involved. Now uh, I am just telling you about uh, a, a spectrogram. A spectrogram generally a hard sound is a one-dimensional time series data. Okay, from one dimension by converting it to a spectrogram, we convert it to three-dimensional data. That is time, frequency, as well as the intensity. So it is more easy by applying Fourier transform. I won't go into details of those things. Applying Fourier transform on the audio signal, it is more concise, more interpretable, robust, and amenable to deep learning. But this is a spectrogram of, audio, of a, uh, some audio sample. It's not a hard disease, spectrogram. This time here, frequency here, all the frequency given here, this, this, at this particular time, if this frequency is there, 512 hertz, that will be bright. If it's not that it will be dark here. So if the bright means the particular frequency sound is that the dark means this frequency above uh, 4000, there's no fully dark, there's no brightness at all. That means there's no sound of this frequency at this particular point of time or any point of time. Here, this is that no, no, this frequency, no sound is that this frequency sound is that. So, it is three dimensional time here. You have frequency also at any point of time. You have frequency, what is frequency given? All frequency coming out, and what is the intensity that's also given. That's a major advantage of spectrogram. So I just say spectrogram for, uh, I took a sample of 1000 data samples, which are divided into the following categories, normal, 200, around 200, aortic stenosis around 200, metal ligation around 200, metal polars, wall polars, MVP around 200, MS 200. You can see the difference in the spectrogram here. They are different from each other. Can slight differences there between this and this. There's more difference here, there's more difference here. So what I did is I converted the data, there is one method, there are multiple methods I'm using. One method is to convert the audio data into to, to a spectrogram. Why spectrograms? Because I am using uh, CNN model uh, method for uh, deep learning. Convolution unit. The convolution unit is built for made for images. So I converted the spectrogram, see so audio data images, so more easily handleable. Uh, I can handle them easily. So CNN is a uh, core of uh, that's a uh, it's a math operation called convolution layer to extend features with the formula. On the input image, then you have a filtering. The convolution uh, form uh, works by sliding a small filter through the image and can computing dot product between kernel and the image pixels at each location. So dot product of one for a particular formula filter and the image pixels to get output. After you have pooling layer. Pooling layer is because data is very huge for image. How to reduce the the input data, the size of data without affecting you say, uh, any uh, quality? So pooling layer by there are many methods of pooling. Max pooling, average pooling, etc. Reduces the spatial dimensions of the feature map while preserving the most important information. So by applying a pooling function, like average of the, uh, the four pixels or maximum of the four pixels, or uh, uh, applying formula to the pixel, so this layer will reduce the spatial dimension, make it more manageable the data. Then the last layer is a fully connected layer, a traditional neural network layer. This takes the input of pooling layer as input and produces final output. This example of uh, CNN architecture. This is input uh, image of somewhat like a two 
processed by uh, convolution layer, then um, pulling layer, max pulling, then uh, some uh, mono max pulling is there, at first fully connected layer is there here, then we have output here. We have output here. It will give uh, whether it's 0 or 1 or 2 or 2 x, that is the output. You give 2, yeah, it will give 2 output. Now, advantage of CNN is that it is very good at running spatial features in images such as what we gap between the different points. So, able to achieve state of the art results on a variety of computer vision tasks, image classification, object detection, segmentation. Then we train a large data set of images to learn complex data. So, uh, there are many applications of uh, CNN. Uh, one is what I am doing is uh, uh, image classification. Now, sometimes you do because you don't have enough data. As I told you, particular medical field, some other field, you have not enough data. So to make a model, you need to have more data. So what you do is you learn tassel learning. For example, tassel learning, how to explain is, uh, suppose I learn, uh, I learn to drive a, a scooter. Uh, I don't need to know, learn so much to drive a motorcycle. Maybe I have to see how to change the gear, that's all, uh, uh, using leg, uh, some hand or to press the accelerator. Some difference is that. Basically, if I learn driving from a scooter, I can learn motorcycle easily. So if I learn driving in one car, I can learn driving in some other vehicle, other car also. If I make a different model car, I can learn easily without having to undergo much training. I just had to get familiar with that uh, model, where is that uh, different uh, uh, access points to do it actually. Uh, the learning time is reduced for new, once I learn basic thing, learning time is reduced. Same way that learning is used for areas where data availability is less. Uh, it's a machine learning technique. Where a model develops for one task is reused as a starting point for a model on a different task. Useful when a second task is similar to first task, like image classification, but when there is limited data available. For example, I'm using images for my project uh, classification, but data is less. I have only 1,000. Whereas we have need 1 million uh, samples of data for image classification for uh, by Google data with 40 million images to added by a cat. I am getting 1000. How to compare this and that? So, what I do is I did transfer learning technique to use that features to even implement it here. That knowledge is better. Leverages the knowledge learned from the one task to improve performance on a second task. This can be used when limited data is there. And when you have a problem with machine learning and deep learning is overfitting. Overfitting means, for example, uh, how to explain it to non competent student is that uh, MA. For example, students study for exam, they will study one question, set of questions, 30 questions. The, those 30 questions they will learn very well. They will uh, in and out, they will buy heart everything. But if you change the questions slightly and give them the exam, they will not be able to write the answer for that particular question. Because they learn, learn the concept, they study the questions and answers. They are not learning the concept. That's called overfitting. Whereas, suppose you study well, you learn to understand the concept and fundamentals, then you can answer any question. But if you have data which is less, then that uh, causes overfitting. That is a problem with uh, uh, deep learning. So we use transfer learning to do uh, remove overfitting to have more data. So benefits of the faster training is that input performance, reduce overfitting, and the overall is powerful technique. Transfer learning figure is given here. This is one uh, data set used for task one. Task one, whatever model learns and builds, that model output is also used as an input for the next model by knowledge transfer. That's what transfer learning. We have different methods, uh, recurrent neural network. I didn't get much accuracy in this actually. I tried but not to get much accuracy. But others have got uh, good accuracy with this over 90 percent also. So this is the, where I uh, use applications. The output depends on the previous input. We have output depends on previous input. For example, I write one, I speak, I uh, type something. How will the computer predict what I'm going to type? It will see the previous input and then the output. So output depends on previous inputs also. What I spoke earlier, the current output depends on that also to understand language the transition and sort of that comes the current new network. We have long term short memory, one type of RNN, it's also used. Uh, then we have data. One problem which uh, same thing is the data, uh, data limit is not in not enough. We have limited data to increase the amount of data artificially by adding creating new data points from exiting data. Then by making a minor changes to exiting data by, by copying the image, protecting. For example, you have, you, have, you have a cat image. You change the intensity in the, uh, the photo to make one more image. Change the brightness in the image. Change the angle of the cat. Make it make it tilted. Make it take uh, add more brightness, contrast, etc. All of you can do that. Then use the new one as a 
generated image new data point that prevents overfitting. It has been found that data point is very, very effective in preventing overfitting. They have been found to be effective. So even for my project also, I am going to use data augmentation to increase the number of data from 1,000 to 2,000. And that's uh, what OK is saying. I'm also going to do the same thing to do it. I wanted to do it uh, maybe in a few days' time. There are, I sold a machine learning model. I talk, digital, I talk about deep learning models. I use CNN and transfer learning. Coming to machine learning model, I extract features on the audio data. Each audio data, does. for example, I extract these features, RMS. Why I'm telling all these things? Because even students can do it. It's not difficult, actually. Once we learn something, uh, you have a guide to tell you all these things. Suppose somebody's experienced, I've done all these things. Now, I can, initially, I didn't know anything when I started this project. Maybe three years back, I didn't know what is what. Now, I can guide an engineering student, and he can do it within four months, what in two years, because uh, I can tell him exactly what to do, based on my experience of what I did wrong here, what I did correctly. So, yeah, extract all the feature, RMS, root mean square energy feature from the audio sound, uh, zero crossing rate, petrol flux, etc. Uh, uh, temporal statistics like mean, variance, experience, et etc. Then, uh, spectral features. Centroid, bandwidth, contrast, roll off, factors, etc. All these features, what we, uh, we do is, except all the features, put in a CSC file. Each audio sample, sample one, sample two, each one row. And then give that full CSC file as input to machine learning algorithm for classification. By different methods. I can use KNN, I can use SVN, I can use a random forest addition, etc. Many frequencies, this is a very important thing. So I won't go into this because it takes a lot of time to explain this. Maybe it's a certain coefficient. Then you have spectral flux, spectral entropy, harmonic speech effect. All the features are extracted. Ultimately, you decide which is required. You extract all features and see which is useful. So many frequency is certain coefficient is one coefficient uh, set up uh, 12 to 13 coefficients which are extracted from audio audio sample. It is a, it is a scale that relates the perceived frequency of tone to actual measure frequency. For example, to hear, actually, compared to the human here, for example, you play one sound from the 400 hertz and 800 hertz, I can make a difference easily. But 800, 600 hertz, I can make a difference so much. I need much more gap. 800 to 1200 hertz, I can't make a difference as I'm making 800, 400, Because as the frequency goes higher, uh, here, human ear cannot distinguish between frequencies unless the gap is very wide. Because 200 to 400, I can distinguish easily. 400 to, uh, to uh, 600, same 200 difference on the SR, but I can't distinguish so easily. But 400 to 800,000 is still more difficult. 800 to 1600, I can distinguish more easily. 600 to 3200, I can distinguish more easily. But 600 to 2000, I cannot distinguish very difficult. It will be difficult. But you map the normal sound to MFCC coefficient, which is mapped to the way of functioning of human ear. Scales the frequency in order to match more closely with what human ear can perceive. Formula is that it's a normal frequency. A map to human ear, what human is humans perceive, is called the male function. 2595 log 1 plus 8500 gives male frequency coefficient. <laughs> it's formula given here, the, the block diagram for the same thing. A break signal into overlapping frames, fast Fourier transform, filter banks, then log, and then fast Fourier transform again. You get sub 2 coefficient. Digital sequence, signal processing, you have extract by uh, do by rule based process systems. Machine learning algorithms, you do machine learning. Deep learning, you do automatic feature extraction. The previous works which have been done by the same line are by Ibrahim, uh, uh, by their excited temporal and spectral features of a hard sound. I'm talking about hard sounds only. They use various ML algorithms and the cubic SVM perform the best. They are accurate in 97%. Van the group has done using spectrogram and convolutional variable transform and used 10 visual transform line techniques. And compared the result and got accuracy, the best one was 98% uh, accuracy. Roy et al. did time domain features, uh, uh, extracted and then classified them based on a CNN based exception model and train time was less, accuracy to 99.45%. Khan et al. group gave, a, they did not do any pre processing, set up a gave a, uh, input to CNN model, took any feature extraction. They got a, they built a model of CNN and uh, they won. New network, uh, the one network called Cardian, Cardinet, got accuracy 98.88%. Uh, one study done by, uh, by the power group is because uh, some people use studies for 5 seconds, some use studies for 10 seconds, 
Some are done for only one second. So what is the ideal time duration required of a heart zone to make it suitable for the best for a heart zone classification? So this Bau et al. group studied that one. Day. They studied and found that extreme duration should be at least two seconds for optimal results. Best results. You can get result good result is 1.2 seconds also. You can get result with 1.5 seconds also. But the best result is with two seconds at least for all the methods. And uh, Takasaki and Kishida did total augmentation by window slicing with spectrogram and synthetic spectrogram based generative adversarial network to generate more data and got accuracy of 93%, 95, 95, 92%. Now, what I did is I used Yasin data set available on the internet, uh, public domain data set, uh, and with uh, this following thing normal 200, AOT stenosis 200, 184, 186 uh, meter stenosis, total 197. Other actually 1000 uh, data sets, but some are uh, uh, less than two seconds. To make it uh, uniform, to remove any unnecessary uh, errors creeping in, I removed those audio sets which are less than two seconds. And what, with those which are more than two, so seconds, five seconds or so, I cut off for two seconds to make it all uniform two seconds from the, that's why from 1000, I got 97 data sets. Now, I did for this AOT stenosis, metal recognition, metal stenosis and metal, and apart from normal, of course. So I got, uh, I got to previous works actually, I skip this. I got the accuracy of, of uh, uh, what it did is converted to audio to a spectrogram. Two categories I did for two categories. One is normal or abnormal. Normal I have about 200, abnormal I have around 800. So I got this for this category a very 100% accuracy. 100% my algorithm will detect whether it's normal or abnormal. Second one is more difficult because we have five folders. I see the five categories. I kept in five folders, each folder containing one category of the, uh, the audio uh, image, image converted to audio converted image spectrogram. I got a, I used a CNN model and a dropout a transfer learning and dropout a 0.5 value. Uh, I don't have time for dropout, no, mean explain it. I got 97% accuracy. It's sometimes varying, sometimes giving 97.8% or 98%, sometimes getting 96%. See, working on this particular thing. This I got 100% exactly. I'm going to do now with data augmentation. And this, for this method, is all, almost over actually. I just want to do once again with data augmentation by generating 1000 more data set. I see and compare with the this result set what I am getting now. Other one which I am doing is parallelly is exciting the features from the audio data set MFCC, zero crossing rate, root mean square, mean, variance, quinus, cortosis, actual contrast, roll off, entropy, common noise ratio by each for each of the hearts on putting in a CAC file and then giving it as input to the machining algorithms and uh, then uh, using multiple algorithms to find out which is the best one. But that as of now, I used some like SVM, KNN, and C, uh, not CN exactly, one different method, classical method is that. But at least I have 90 percent, but still it's not good enough actually. You need to be uh, at least getting 97 percent to be good enough for uh, sending to a paper for uh, gender for publication. Which will try to study further and see which is best one. Remove unnecessary features and uh, choose features by using PCA method, the principal component analysis method. That is, uh, yeah, I suppose you have. I didn't use PCA much for this uh, uh, mod, this uh, project because PCA used for for projects where we have uh, lots of features. Principal component analysis that is using eigenvector eigenvalue to reduce, to reduce the features to a, a more um, a manageable size so as to make it computable. You know, otherwise it takes too much time. We have one thousand or one lakh features for every uh, sample. Difficult to do computation it takes long time. So PCA is a method. To reduce the number of features, and it will do on its own and check which is the most 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 suitable features, and then uh, based on the output also, and then give a list of small list of features. So that has to be done further to find out what can be done better in better way. So the references I given is uh, the pre whatever I taken from the previous initial introduction is from my own uh, chapter in the book, a survey in machine of machine learning in healthcare uh, in in uh, collaboration with my. Um, my earlier guide, uh, Professor Sanjay Chitris in uh, Dianne Sagar University, and uh, of course, uh, World Health Foundation report. Then afterwards, uh, others like Ibrahim and other groups are there. I also use reference my own uh, uh, review paper, which I did earlier. The tools which I used are Python and Google Colab. As of now, I may use other tools also, like in uh, Amazon Web Service also I may use. But as of now, I'm using these two only. Uh, I almost finished one thing, and I want to send a writing paper for that.
the other methods i am extracting data and seeing which is suitable for so it any questions please ask me one that will not be defects uh, the, the, the details are there here uh, if you want to know about it then other term which i use i give a definition in neural network is what is neural network appellate from birth to completion of one month completion for a cardiac pcg etc like that yeah. then completion matrix is that which is used in machine learning matrix then uh, you have uh, calculate various parameters like accuracy false positive rate sensitivity uh, etc and so uh, specificity precision recall ethan score i got ethan score of 98 percent also from my uh, first one second one uh, i'm getting about 90 percent ethan score is uh, you calculate uh, it is more uh, gives a balance of uh, precision recall uh, when the data set is imbalanced you have more of one type and less of other type then this uh, factor is metric is more important ethan score is high means model is good should get above 90% is a very good model. It gives a balance of recall and precision both. Precision is uh, measure the proportion of positive predictions because the model has both negative and positive. So positive, how much you predict correctly, that's precision. Recall is uh, measure the probability of de detection of the proportion of actual positive that we have predicted correctly, actual uh, proportion of positive that are predicted correctly. Then uh, what are the other pro problems here actually? In uh, this uh, field, is that one is uh, hello. Uh, uh, data equation is a uh, basic problem with uh, this methods uh, availability of data, privacy and security, quality of data, and data should be there for long, long time. That is one thing. Then uh, overfitting is a big problem. Data leakage is a big problem. The bias which comes in data because of uh, uh, we measure. For example, when I measure the heart sounds for a small child. I generally I mentioned in four places. The near metal wall, tracker speed wall, aortic wall, and uh, the, the, the fourth wall, uh, a pulmonary wall. But for a small child, the, the, the heart is so small. The instrument which I use, the electronic stethoscope, I used some I used the instrument called HC step. Electronic stethoscope is connected to a tab. It records the sound and passes to a tab and uh, saves in the saving tab. But the instrument the surface area of the instrument for recording is so big. It covers the half, half the wall, half the heart. So it's very difficult to, uh, to judge actually. The quality of the instrument is varying based on people use different instruments for, for the research. And uh, data available is there, but they may use different uh, data. The parameters for the, uh, the instrument are different. And uh, now suppose they given some data on the public data set. I don't know to which wall they kept it uh, for recording. Suppose I keep near the aortic wall, SM may be less than SOU more. Suppose I keep the instrument near the tracker speed wall, then I still will more and I still will be less. So all these problems are there with the data set, which are, still take a long time to recover and for doctors to get confidence in data set. Then the black box is there, of course, uh, because uh, you don't, can't explain. Interpreting it is uh, difficult. Then uh, no evidence is there. Quarter uh, research also we need to have improved, actually. Then privacy is there, security. Then in then just, all stakeholders are involved in this implementation of the, the uh, medical uh, AI in healthcare. It's not the one group of scientists doing research. Ultimately, the many different stakeholders had to come together to implement something actually for the user to use it. So integration tasks are to be done. Privacy is a question actually, which is very important for, uh, for medical area. Safety is a very important thing. Contability is, as I told you, already important. There are many regulations which have taken into account. The social there are a lot of fear and mistrust about these advanced devices. And because of inequality, misunderstanding, and overestimation, all the problems that which are yet to be overcome and will take some time, maybe another few years, for A can be completely integrated in healthcare in whatever possible ways. So, with this, I close my, my talk. Thanks to the organizers, uh, Disciple India Learning Forum. Thanks to Dr. Rupa Tantri and Dr. Mr. Shiv Prasad for uh, enabling me to make a presentation of my research work. Uh, I hope that it has helped to, in some extent, to understand the area of work and also a little bit about AI and machine learning and deep learning. Any questions, please uh, feel free to ask me. Sorry for exceeding the time. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, dear participants, you have any questions? You can type in the chat box. Otherwise, you can ask. Unmute and ask the question. I think uh, Professor Salma has a question. You have raised yes, your hand, sir. madam. Yes, Please. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Satinarin, sir, my ah, question yeah. is, 
हार्ड प्रोडिक्शन हार्ड डिसीज प्रोडिक्शन और एनी प्रोडिक्शन Uh, why only classification only is considered why not clustering is so much into research there are two methodologies now so classification ah, yes, 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 yes. why not clustering is such beneficial in conducting uh, these kind of uh, predictions or uh, analysis okay. or is it there uh, and i am not aware <laughs> okay one thing is because uh, here in this case uh, we need to know what is normal and what is abnormal and in, for further classification you need to know have samples of each sound like uh, metal stenosis aortic uh, ar aortic stenosis aortic stenosis etc i need to know in advance then i can uh, give as input uh, then what is uh, possible actually uh, clustering can be used some other field sir but in the medical field i need to know what i need as input to have faith in the output otherwise may be difficult to use it actually हाइब्रिड मॉडल SVM you have used CNN you use yes so yes. before using uh, these techniques for the classification have you conducted any test on the basic uh, data ah uh, what i did is uh, as of now i am already having data which is uh, kept for this particular purpose for science, for the people researchers across the world to use it for their work actually uh, but suppose i am recording my own data Then I have to check whether the data is okay, whether the noise level is uh, tolerable. All those things I have to do. But for public data set, which is meant for researchers only, that is taking care of all the way one researcher. Data is kept and uh, post be post and filtered to make it suitable for the researchers. My own data, suppose I record, I have to do many much more work to make it usable. My question is. Uh... how can you conclude the svm and cnn are best for your the your uh, data how see, you conclude it see, see uh, cnn i got 100% result for normal abnormal uh, for svm i use other technique for different method actually i won't say it is so after actually. conducting uh, okay so you got very good accuracy but yes, before yes. conducting uh, this uh, experiment how you decided cnn is best for this uh, this no, data i i tried many methods actually i also uh, read papers about what others had done uh, for uh, for image classification uh, directly after converting into spectrogram i use cnn because cnn because cnn is made for images like yes, image and cnn made for each other that's so why i use uh, cnn and transform one into input accuracy for uh, feature extraction method Where I extract features from the audio one by one and put in a CSV file in a row, one row. That one, that time, that one, I have uh, basically for choosing. I am, I am uh, using many different methods. In that, I tried other methods also, but I got SVM and KNN the best results. The best results I got SVM and KNN, but it's not good enough. I still do further. I got, I tried in the in this in the NAE base also. But it's giving low accuracy, below ninety percent or eighty five percent or so. Whereas uh, SVM can get better results. But that I can't say I computed and finished. It is still ongoing process. But uh, method which is spectrograms, partly completed, partly I am still trying to improve the accuracy. That's all it is. Sir, you have used confusion matrix uh, for the accuracy. Yes. Uh, what are the actual data you have given? What you are predicting? Uh, so actual data given is uh, since we have already uh, positive case negative cases uh, given that as uh, input and then afterwards based on the output given by the what are these positive and negative cases this case suppose the heart disease is there this okay. is there that is positive is not that means negative that's all it is okay. fine your good name uh, sorry i didn't get your name uh, dr patil okay maybe you can uh, I'll send my, my email to you. In chat box, yes. you can uh, send me the email to you. 
participants any other questions sir i have a very general question ah, yes madam uh, as you said getting a medical data uh, it is very difficult sir getting data set is the biggest problem ah yes that's a big uh, problem will simulating any data set and using that to give satisfactory results or how to yeah. get because for people uh, generally doing research in this area. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, generally, we have researcher should have a tie up with the hospital and uh, uh, make a presentation to the hospital in front of the AHS committee that is going to use it for uh, research purpose only, not for any other purpose, not going to, uh, to misuse data, some may use for commercial purpose also. After getting all the approvals, uh, data is available, but I think you have to go through the undergo the process to get get it for your use. Data is there in silos in the hospital. They don't share openly with others. That's a problem uh, which uh, uh, you have to face and then try to get uh, around it. For example, I have made a presentation to the HS committee of our uh, Sanjivini hospital and got approval to use the data. Now, after getting the approval, I had to go and collect data now for PDT cases. What I've done now is, now is the public data set, but once I get data from BDD cases, I have to just check initially with the same algorithm and change data set also, change the input and see. And afterwards, trying to need based on the new data to get better results if possible. Data set is always difficult actually, but luckily for researchers, for any any area, any domain for cancer, for imaging, for heart swans, and so many other, for diabetics, etc., so many areas, some public data set available. Which you can begin your work. People have published these papers with the public data set also. For example, the Asin data set, which I'm talking about, a lot of papers only on that data set. And there's one other data, uh, other organization group called the Physionet. They are uh, mostly interested with medical data set only. Every year they give a competition, they conduct competition where they, they put out a public data set for one particular domain. The ones they put for 2016 also they put for medical data set and again for uh, for, for heart tone data set. Again, as recently they put for medical uh, for heart data set. Every day they put for different data set. All researchers around the world use data set for the, the, the model, submit itself to them and the, for the competition, then get uh, uh, get to see where they stand. So uh, there are some groups like that which keep public data set, uh, make available to everybody for researchers. Because uh, after all, we are not using it for commercial purpose, we only doing it for uh, purely academic purpose. So they are making it possible for us to get data set from public, from public facilities. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. There is one more question in the chat box. With okay. AI, can robots only operate the patients in future? Uh, it is possible to do so, but with human supervision. I would say that. Hello. So you can hear me? Hi, ah, yes, I can hear you. Hello. Ah, yes. yes, there's one more question. What will be the scope of the doctors in future? Ah. AI yes. takes over. Okay. The uh, thing is that uh, healthcare will be more accessible. Maybe I will, uh, and they can do much quicker. Doctor, you can, we are using phones for our work. Uh, let's say we are, earlier we do calculation with hand, using calculator to work faster. Same way doctors can integrate AI into the workflow to do the work faster. In the day, if they treat 10 patients, in the complex complex cases, they can treat uh, 50 patients, 100 patients also. That way, health can be more accessible, much cheaper also compared to the present day, uh, day levels. So it will be very efficient for all, I feel. Actually. More accessible, cheaper, smaller, faster, everything will be for the positive only. Every new technology will make something redundant actually, but in this case, doctors can uh, 
always be useful. But doctor integrated using AI for his work. Instead of a normal stethoscope, doctor may use an advanced instrument to measure That's many cool. things from the person when the patient comes to him. Many more parameters. Not just stethoscope, that's what we do. Any other question? Please let me know. I don't have any question, sir, but uh, the answer for the question asked, if AI replace uh, what will the future of the doctor, Okay. Uh, AI is, it cannot replace the intelligence, sir. Yes. Uh, human being is more intelligent. AI do mistake, but uh, human being uh, may not do the mistakes. Ah, yes. Uh, correct. Human being yeah. ultimately is superior because, because it is, is artificial only. It's correct. Human being only created AI. So AI can never be superior to human being. Yeah. Ultimately, human being will control and, and supervise the working of the AI system. And every generation there is a change, uh, which uh, uh, total very drastic change actually. Uh, so people have to accept change. And for example, many are using uh, so many different tools now. Is not available 15 years back. All students are using internet for listening to lectures, which we are not having when we are students. Uh, so we had a change of technique of teaching compared to what our teachers taught us. So there will be a change, certainly, but change for the better, I think. Better for everybody. So we have to adopt to the changes. What will happen in the future? Uh, yes, uh, a doctor will not adopt to the changes. Then will be a good doctor. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, there are a lot of uh, compliments and feedbacks which have been given, sir. I'll read out some uh, of it. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your time. Kindly, uh, can you share your uh, contact number? Okay. There's one I'll, question. If I'll you can share your contact number and email ID. They can uh, directly contact you, sir. Okay. So, sir, is sharing in the uh, chat box. Ah, yes, sir. You can uh, save it. I shared my One of the best sections organized by forum. Very informative. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your compliments. Uh, thanks to everybody for the patient listening. Um, uh, thanks to, uh, I'm thankful to the organizer for uh, making this possible and, and inviting me, as particularly Dr. Rupa Tantri and Mr. Shiva Prasad. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for being a part of Disciples India Learning Forum. Uh, dear participants, I have shared a link in the chat box. That's a Google feedback form. Kindly fill up the form and uh, you'll be getting your e-certificates in seven working days. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would request uh, Professor Salma uh, from the Department of Computer Science to give the word of thanks. Over to you, madam. Uh, madam, you can hear me? I think she's muted. Patil, sir? Patil, sir, are you there? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Sir, if Salma, madam, is not there, you can only hear, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation and... Uh, you have given a lot of information about uh, the uh, analysis of the heart sounds by using AI technique. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all the 
coordinators once again i thank all the coordinator and the presenter thank you sir thank you sir madam we can view the meeting yes uh, thank you very much for the word of thanks uh, sir padil sir yes. and thank i again thank uh, c vidya institute of technology for being uh, associate partner for this session and i really thank the participants for giving their time to understand how the ai works and the main thank is to uh, mr satyanarayana sir for his time thank you very much sir thank you thank you all wish you all a happy weekend and a great night